So this is going to be the course outline um, for today. Uh, we're going to look at what valuation is. Then from there, we would also look at the qualitative side of valuation. Basically, we would illustrate through a transaction flow, um, necessitating you know, a corporate action um, warranting the valuation of a business. So that's going to be the qualitative side of business valuation. And then from there, we would also look at the quantitative side of valuation. The quantitative side of valuation deals with the various methodologies or approaches for undertaking the evaluation you know, of a business. And then from there, we would also do some brief practical, some hands-on experience or practice you know, about what business valuation is all about. Because I believe that if we go through the theory and we don't do a bit of practicals, everything is going to look so abstract, you know, just as we were taught in schools you know, those days. So this is the outline for today's session. What is valuation? And uh, that explanation, we would consider um, what it entails. Again, we would also look at certain situations or corporate events that will trigger the need for valuation. And then we will also demonstrate a transaction flow that um, basically is necessitating or calling for the need for organizations to do evaluation. Then we would also look at the quantitative side of it. Here, basically, we will focus on, as I said, the various methodologies that you can use to derive the value of a business. So that said, let's start. So first and foremost, one will ask what is business valuation? What is business valuation? The simple definition of a business valuation process is that it is a process of determining the economic value of a business. The process of determining the economic value of a business. Now one would ask, what is the economic value of a business? Basically, when we say economic value, all we are saying is that it is a maximum price or amount of money that someone is willing to pay for a good or a service. So in the context of valuation, economic value of a business would mean the maximum amount of money that someone would be willing to pay for a business. Okay, so this tells us that if it is the maximum amount that you are looking at paying to acquire a business or to invest in a business, then it means that the essence of valuation should be done in such a way that you don't end up undervaluing or overvaluing the business. The operating word here or the operating words here are economic and value. The economic value, the maximum amount of money that people are willing to pay or to invest in a business. And so therefore, in the context of you choosing your valuation methodologies or approaches. You should do it in such a way that you don't end up either undervaluing or overvaluing the business, okay? Because at the end of the day, whatever you do would be assessed by what we call another entity called um, a fairness assessor or an independent consultant who will pick the valuation reports and the Excel sheet and all of that. And then also assess the fairness of the, um, values you have arrived at based on your approaches or methodologies. And then would also okay it and say that yes, indeed, um, the valuation is fair. The values you are quoting actually reflects the true and the fair market value you know, of a business. So that is what business valuation entails. Always um, put in mind that you are determining the maximum price or amount of money that somebody would be willing to pay for a business. And so therefore you shouldn't end up overvaluing or undervaluing the business. And the next thing we, I want us to look at is when is valuation needed? There are certain corporate events or um, occurrences that would necessitate you know, the need for a business to be valued. And every business has a value, I must say. Whether you are a startup, whether you've been in business for one year, two years, or a very long period of time, you have a value. 
And at some point in time, you will need to determine you know, your value. So what are some of the corporate events that will necessitate the need for um, valuation? First and foremost, for instance, when you want to raise, you know, equity capital, you want to raise money, you know, you would want to place a value on the business. So whoever is coming to invest in the business will know how much in monetary spend they should pay and also proportionally how many shares they are going to acquire in the business by reason of the injecting capital in the business. Again, when you want to sell your business, this happens a lot in most advanced economies where people grow their businesses up to a point in time and then they exit it for another investor and then they move on to the next, you know, they start up um, the next business. So when you want to sell a business, obviously you would also want to place, you know, the value, you want to place a value on the business. The next thing is when you want to acquire, you know, a business. Uh, mostly this is done in M&A transactions um, where organizations acquire different organizations and they would want to place you know a value on the business again when there is bankruptcy when there is bankruptcy um you would want to value a business litigation issues also you know may necessitate you know um, business valuation for instance if there is shareholder um, battles or disputes and the owners want to part away from the business of course um, the court would order that a business valuation is undertaken. Another reason for valuing a business would be when there is an IPO, that's an initial public you know, offering where you would want to move beyond just being a private company and come on a stock market. And so therefore you would want to appoint a transactions advisor to work on the transaction. And as part of working on a transaction, it will necessitate um, a value valuation process. Sorry, there is this, um, there is this thing that's appearing on my screen and it's making it difficult for me to, let me, necessitate valuation is when, for instance, equity research analysts, you know, um, as part of their work, would want to place a buy, a sell, or a hold, you know, um, opinion or a recommendation on a stock that trades on the stock market. So you want to make investment recommendations. It is very essential for you to, you know, um, perform valuation because you cannot just get up and um, say, for instance, EcoBank or Standard Chartered Bank is a buy or, or a sell. You have to uh, perform certain valuations and then based on the range of values that you would you know um, derive that would inform the recommendation that you're actually going to make to investors you know uh, so these are some of the reasons or corporate events or actions that would necessitate you know or that would trigger a valuation process um, is there any question that anybody wants to ask so far, from the definition through to the various events that will trigger evaluation process. All right, so in the absence of any questions, um, we may have to move on. So this slide is looking at what valuation entails. You know, when we say business valuation, what exactly does it entail? Um, first and foremost, valuation involves analysis of financial history and prospects of a business, a project or an asset. Um, this is why it is very necessary that you, as a finance student or as a business student or wherever you find yourself in, it is very necessary for you to be able to learn the basics of financial analysis. Um, you don't just get up to value a business. It starts from somewhere. You have to be able to pick, you know, financial statements and then analyze it. Know what is driving revenue, what is driving expenses, what has been the trend, you know, over the period. And based on that, you'll be able to do forecast, apply some metrics to, you know, forecast the financial statement. So one key component of business valuation is financial analysis. It is very, very critical. 
and um, it starts from somewhere. There's a skill that you can actually build and develop, you know, over time. When you go on the stock market and you download financial statements, you read through them, you just organize your thoughts together, study them, put together, you know, brief reports and all of that. You'll be able to build and grow your skills in financial analysis. If you are not able to do financial analysis, um, performing business valuation may be quite, you know, problematic because they're very key component of business um, valuation. Again, forecasting is very key, you know, in valuations, especially when you get to discounted cash flows, the income valuation approaches and all of that. It would require that you forecast, you know, the future operations of a business based on certain um, happenings or historical happenings or based on what may, you know, likely happen, you know, in future. It also entails analysis of the industry. Every industry that you are operating in or that the business is operating in, whether it is going to have a positive or a negative outlook in future um, would have serious implications on the value of the business. Um, if an industry is projected, if I'm operating, for instance, if a business, for instance, is operating in an industry that is very promising, um, when there is growth in the industry, it finds a way of filtering through into the um, financial performance of the operators or the actors or the businesses in um, the respective industry. So it entails analysis of the industry, especially when you are putting together the valuation reports. It would require that you do some analysis you know, on the industry that the business that you are valuing actually is op operating in. Again, it also entails economic you know, analysis, analysis of the economic you know, environment. All these um, economic indicators like policy rates, interest rates, inflation rate, GDP growth rate, all of them have you know, a way of imp um, impacting the value of businesses. Um, they have a way of impacting weighted average cost of capital, for instance. They have a way of impacting what we call terminal value you know, and all of that. So, Valuation is quite a big deal. It requires some kind of economics knowledge, some kind of finance knowledge, some kind of you know, marketing knowledge. It entails a lot, but it is fun when you um, grab it and then you keep working on improving your skills. I believe that you will be fine. So these are some of the things that you know, um, valuation entails. Then again, it also entails applying acceptable valuation methods. We will get to the uh, methods or the approaches that can be used to value, you know, um, a business. And depending on the purpose for which you are valuing the business, it would require that you place a higher weight on certain, you know, uh, methods than others. There are three main methods, as I said, we will get to that. But these are some of the things that, you know, you do when you are valuing a business. Um, any questions so far? Any questions? All right, so let's move on. The qualitative aspects of valuation. The qualitative aspects of valuation. Valuation is not all about calculations, you know, and Excel works and all of that. There is also a qualitative aspect. And what do I mean? Um, there are certain transactions that, um, as I said earlier on, would call for the need for you to value a business. And it is not all about you know, calculations. So over here, we are going to demonstrate a transaction flow where valuation becomes a critical component of that particular transaction. So we are demonstrating a qualitative side of valuation through a private placement transaction. If I say a private placement transaction, what I mean is that a company probably will want to attract you know, private capital or has gotten to a point where they need some private capital to be able to expand or to grow organically or to show up their operations and all of that. So when that organization gets to um, that crossroad, it would need to value, you know, the management would need to value the business. And this is a transaction flow for such a transaction or a corporate action. So first and foremost, that transaction will start with early discussions and the appointment of a transaction advisor. And discussions are going to go on between um, the business, the management of the business, 
um, about the need for them to raise capital. And then again, um, following from which a transaction advisor and investment banker, I mean, would be appointed to execute the transaction. Once the appointment is done, the next stage will be the signing of engagement and confidentiality agreements. This stage is very critical. These transactions are very sensitive in the sense that it comes with a lot of you know, um, documentation that as the transaction advisor you will be privy to. And it is it wouldn't be ethical for you to be disclosing, you know, um, company corporate information that you've come into contact with. So um, that stage is very critical before the organization would release or the business for which you would be valuing would release certain information to you. It could be corporate information, um, trade secrets and all of that, financial performance and all of that. You have to sign a confidentiality you know, agreement following from which an engagement letter would be given to you and then you start you know, work. After signing of those agreements, you would now move to the r and valuation and the preparation of evaluation reports. Um, you would need, as I said, several documentations like the historical financial performance of the company, audited financial statements, you know, the operating models, the management team, and all of that. And again, a lot of interactions and discussions goes on between you, and the transaction advisor, and a key part, your, a key person in the business that's the accountant of the firm. Um, so many discussions are made, you know, regarding valuing the business, how they recognize, you know, how the accounting policy treats, for instance, depreciation and all of that. So it's, it's a very detailed, you know, work to actually undertake. Then after valuation is done, then you prepare what we call the information memorandum. The information memorandum basically acts more or less like a marketing document that would market the business that you have valued, you know, to potential um, investors. In the information memorandum, you see traces of um, economics in it, you see traces of industry, you see traces of um, the operating model of the business, its plans, its business plans and all of that. So that is also um, a document that's actually been prepared, you know, in, in such a transaction. After the preparation of the information memorandum and all of that, and it's been submitted to potential investors who are interested in investing in the business, then there is a fairness assessment by an independent advisor. Most of the times, the interested investor would also appoint uh, what we call an independent advisor, uh, who would assess the valuation that you know the transaction advisor has done, you know, to confirm whether or not um, the value is fair, uh, to confirm whether or not the um, valuation that has been done doesn't exceed or the company uh, is not overvalued. Remember, in the definition, we said it is a process that is used to determine the economic value. You know of a business so the independent assessor or the advisor also assess the fairness of you know the valuation that has been done and when they also okay it then the investor will now trigger a due diligence you know to be done on the company due diligence is more or less like investigations um, you investigate historically the business you investigate the current performance of the business as well as the potential performance of the business and that will usually manifest in you know, financial due diligence. And the lawyers will also do the legal due diligence. Then the accountants must also do the tax you know, due diligence because at the end of the day, you wouldn't want to invest your, 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 your capital in the business that is not you know, tax compliant. So due diligence is very, very critical. After the due diligence takes place, then there is negotiation. So I want to invest in your business. You are telling me uh, the value ranges between 50 to 100 Ghana cities. Let's negotiate, let's come to a middle ground. You know, that is where the negotiations you know, take place. So once all the parties come to a fair you know, ground, and in all of these, a transaction advisor acts more or less like the liaison party um, between the business that has been valued and then the new investor that is coming you know, on board. So there is negotiations and when the negotiations become successful, then of course there is capital injection 
into the business and further documentation. The capital injection is basically going to be the value you know, that has been placed you know, on the business. And then um, the documentation will take effect you know, to um, trigger some modifications or changes in shareholder structure, the new shareholders, and all of that. So valuation, as I said, doesn't happen in a vacuum. There is always something that triggers you know, the need for a business to be valued. And there is a typical example of a situation or a corporate action that will necessitate the business, a business to be valued. There are so many you know, transactions. It could be right issues, it could be you know, mergers and acquisitions, and all of that um, similar, all of those similar you know, um, transactions. So, so far, any questions so far? Any questions, contributions, additions? I would want this to be very interactive, please. Let's talk. Mm. All right, can I move on in the absence of any questions? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, thank you. So now we are going to look at the quantitative side of valuation. I know this is where uh, most people ordinarily would have expected that I start from. But it is very necessary to provoke your thoughts as to what would necessitate us to value a business. That's why I decided to start from you know, the previous slides, uh, run you through certain transactions that would necessitate you know, a call for um, evaluation process. So we are now going to look at the quantitative side of business valuation. And we will start by what we call IFRS 13. The valuations of business is actually governed, or let me say the accounting standard that is relevant for carrying out valuations is International Financial Reporting Standards 13. That's fair value measurement, fair value measurement. So the starting point for the valuation of any business um, is IFRS 13. I would encourage all of you to actually get a copy online of IFRS 13, download it and study you know, what it talks about with respect to fair value measurement. It gives a very detailed guide you know, as to what you are supposed to do when you are valuing um, a business. If you use any approach that is outside you know, the international financial reporting standards. Remember, a fairness assessor or an independent consultant can pick it and then check whether or not you know, the procedure you use to arrive at the value of the business is in line with this um, international accounting standard. So IFRS 13 governs you know, the conduct or guides the conduct of business valuations. And according to IFRS state, and there are three main approaches for determining the value of a business. The first is the market approach, and that's what we're going to do today. Um, the market approach, what we call relative value. And then we also have the cost approach and the income approach. Let me quickly run you through the cost approach and the income approach, then we would zoom into the market you know, approach. That's what I've just been you know, to be done for today. So the cost approach basically is what we call the, the, the re current replacement cost. And its purpose is to determine the amount that would be you know, currently required to replace the service capacity of an asset, you know, adjusted for, for obsolescence. So mostly this cost approach is used you know, it's mostly performed by, for instance, property valuation, you know, um, companies where they, they undertake this procedure to determine the current value, you know, of a property, you know, um, taking into consideration or making adjustment for things like depreciation, like obsolescence, such as physical deterioration, technological or economic obsolescence. So that is the cost you know, approach. And it's very, very needed, especially when you are valuing a, a, an organization that is, 
say, a factory, a very big factory, you know, or a processing company that has significant, you know, volumes of properties. It is very necessary that a property valuation is actually, you know, undertaken in addition to the other, you know, two valuation um, methodologies. And as I said earlier, the cost approach is used for the measurements, mostly for tangible assets, you know, of the organization, tangible assets that are developed, you know, internally by the um, organization. So that is a cost approach. The income approach is where we do the discounted cash flow. This is where a lot of forecasting is very much needed, you know, in determining the value of, of a business. You forecast the cash flows and you discount them into present times to determine an intrinsic value of the business. And under income approach, there are um, sub methodologies such as the discounted cash flows, um, free cash flows to the firm, free cash flows to equity, and all the discount you know, models. All of those methodologies come under the income approach. Then what we have for today, the markets approach, the relative value approach. This valuation methodology operates on the assumption that organizations that operate within the same industry Okay, um, that exhibits similar growth characteristics, similar capital structure characteristics, half or fall within um, a range of values that are closer to each other. So for instance, the assumption behind um, this market approach would be that if you pick, for instance, Ecobank or any of the, the, the publicly traded you know, banking companies, um, the assumption with the market approach would be that if an organization like Ecobank is operating, you know, and is operating and trading on the stock market, and for instance, some big bank that is not on the market would want to be valued. The idea behind this would be that some big bank, probably if it is exhibiting the same capital structure with Ecobank, it is exhibiting the same revenue growth over a period of time and all of that. The assumption behind the market approach would be that Stambik Bank has the same relative value with Ecobank Ghana Limited. That is the assumption of the market's approach. And we'll go much detail into it so that you would understand it better. And under it, we have a public company multiples or comparables. And then we also have the precedent transactions method. And that would be explained, I think, in the next slide, yes. So the market approach, as I said earlier, it considers the market prices of similar companies to determine the economic value of a business. So assuming um, there is a savings and loans company, okay, that is a private company and would want to raise capital. Um, the savings and loans company may use the market approach to determine its relative value, its value relative to the banks that are listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange. That is the idea behind the market approach. And when businesses are similar concerning the industry, I believe I, I made this point earlier, concerning the industry, revenue growth potential, market influence and all of that, the market approach becomes very ideal, you know, as a method for valuation. Similarities is very, very essential. Um, you cannot, use a market approach if the organizations are completely different from each other. For instance, you want to value um, a real estate business and then you are picking details of banks. That is actually not going to work because they operate in completely different industries. There are even instances where you cannot use companies that operate within the same industry to determine the relative value of the subject company or the company that you would want to you know, um, um, value. For instance, if the, the companies have completely different accounting policies, you know, compared to the company that you want to value, going to use those companies as the comparables, you know, approach may be quite, you know, problematic. And we are also saying that this market approach works very well when data is available to make comparisons very easy to be done. You know, sometimes, one of the problems with valuation is, especially when um, you are valuing a business 
a private organization, for instance, and in the industry that it is operating, you don't have any similar company that is trading on the Ghana stock exchange. Sometimes it becomes quite problematic because then it means that you have to move to other stock exchanges like the Jube stock exchange, like um, the Nigerian stock exchange or the Kenyan stock exchange to fish out companies, you know, that exhibit similar characteristics or that operate within the same industry of the business that you are valuing in Ghana. And sometimes to get in information from those places are also, you know, um, um, quite difficult, but it is very easy and it becomes an ideal method for you to use once there is publicly available, you know, information for you to leverage. Now, the public company comparable method uses valuation metrics of public traded companies, similar to the subject company. I believe this has been said earlier. And the value of a business is derived from the pricing of comparable businesses. So under the market approach, we have the comparables method and then the precedent transactions method. This method derives the value of the subject company by using pricing multiples based on observed transactions of comparable companies. So observed transactions like, um, let's say, an m and you know, transaction, um, an organization that is operating within the same industry and is about undertaking a similar transaction or a corporate action may want to rely on the pricing multiples that were arrived at, you know, in that deal or in that transaction, and they use that to determine the relative value of that particular business. So there are two uh, main methodologies under the market approach, the comparables method, where you use the multiples of publicly traded companies, and then the precedent transactions method, where you leverage past transactions, past similar transactions, and that has occurred to you know, determine or arrive at the value of a subject company. Okay, still on the market approach. So now we're going to focus solely on the trading comparables method, the trading comparables method. And in this method, you would come across these um, phrases a lot, enterprise value and then equity value enterprise value and equity value. It is used a lot in the trading comparables method of valuation. And let me explain what these two means because you are going to use them a lot. Even when you do discounted cash flow analysis and all of that, you will still need these two, um, these two guys, enterprise value and equity value. So when we say enterprise value, what we are saying that is that it's the value of a firm that accrues to both shareholders and debt holders combined you know, of a firm. And there's a formula. Enterprise value is equal to market capitalization plus debt minus cash. Now, let me break this definition down so that we all have a fair understanding of what enterprise value is. Market capitalization plus debt minus cash. Somebody may ask, why are we taking out cash? First and foremost, enterprise value is the total value of a business that both shareholders and debt holders have entitlement to. The market capitalization component is the equity component of the, the business. And then the debt component, I don't know which rights were to use in addition to, apart from that, but it is a component that accrue to, let's say, creditors. So for instance, if you, if you are buying a company, okay, the company may have creditors and the creditors would want to lay claim or some kind of ownership on the business. So what it means is that you have to pay the shareholders of the business, that's the market capitalization component, the equity component. Then again, you also have to pay the creditors of the business. And what are you going to use to finance this debt? It is the cash that the business has that you would use to reduce the debt or to pay off the creditors of the business. So for instance, if I, if, if I purchase or if you purchase a business, automatically, you assume both assets and liabilities of the business. 
part of their liabilities are going to be interest-bearing debt. It could be short-term debt or it could be long-term debt or medium-term debt or whatever. You also have cash that you would have entitlement to as part of the total package for purchasing the business. The cash component is what you are going to use to service the debts of the business. In addition to the purchase amounts that you are going to pay for the equity holders or the shareholders. Now, for instance, if you look at, um, let's practicalize it. If you remember, there was a time that um, this bank, GCB Bank, you know, um, acquired some assets and liabilities of, you know, different capital banks and, and, and UT Bank. Automatically, GCB Bank assumed the liabilities or the creditors. You know, you acquire them. Then again, GCB Bank also had access to the cash of these two banks. The cash would be used to reduce or was used to reduce the creditor amount of the business. This is the whole idea behind enterprise value. And cash is deducted because it is used to reduce the effective purchase price of the business. For example, if I buy a house, this is a hypothetical example, if I buy a house for let's say $1 million and I enter the house and there is say $200,000 in the house, the effective purchase price of the house is $800,000 and not the 1 million. The cash has reduced the purchase price, even though the consideration the original price was one million. There is a cash amount of two hundred thousand, which effectively reduces the purchase price, you know, of that particular facility, the building. So this is the breakdown of what enterprise value is all about. Equity value, on the other hand, is the value of a business that is attributable. To, uh, shareholders. I believe this one, it is very self you know, explanatory. When you pick every financial statement, you see total equity and all of that. And sometimes market capitalization is used interchangeably with equity value, but there is some slight you know, um, difference. Market capitalization is the total value of all outstanding shares of a company. So the price and the issue shares gives you the market capitalization. And the equity value mostly seen on the financial statement of a company, basically looking at the assets, less the liabilities you know, of the firm. So that is what equity value and markets, sorry, and enterprise value is all about. In most cases, enterprise value is usually higher than equity value. So that said, let's progress. We are going to use these a lot, enterprise value and equity value. We are going to use them a lot, as I said, in the trading comparables method. So how income statement, where we have the top line items, revenue, true to the down line items, no part. This is net operating profit after tax. These are key income items, revenue, EBITDA and EBIT, as well as earnings before tax. EBITDA is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. EBIT is earnings before interest and tax. And then we all know what earnings before tax is, and then operating profit after tax. Now, we are saying that if the denominator is before interest expense, then the ratio is an enterprise value ratio. So for instance, we have EV to revenue multiple or EV to revenue ratio. Enterprise value divided by revenue. It is an enterprise value ratio. Why are we saying so? We are saying that if the denominator is before interest expense, remember, the formula we derive for enterprise value is that it's a value that accrues to both shareholders and debt providers of the business. So with respect to revenue, both shareholders and debt providers have a stake in the revenue of a business. 
Because if you come down, there is going to be an interest component on the debt that you owe. And you are going to pay them out of these revenues that you actually want to make. So whatever line item that occurs before interest is an enterprise value multiple. So we have revenue, it occurs before interest. And so therefore it's an enterprise value multiple. We also have EV divided by EBITDA. So enterprise value to EBITDA multiple is there. Then we also have enterprise value to EBIT, EV to EBIT multiple, EV to EBIT multiple. All of these are occurring before interest expenses. That's why they are called enterprise value. Have it in mind that with enterprise value, the value is accruing to both shareholders and interest, or oh, sorry, debt um, providers. Now let's come to equity value ratio. If the denominator is after interest expense, then it is an equity ratio. So for instance, PE ratio, price to earnings ratio. By the time the company gets to earnings, everything here accrues to shareholders. Debt holders have already been paid here. The government would have already been paid here. So debt holders do not have interest in the operating profits after tax because they've already been paid out of the revenues that was generated. So it is going to shareholders. So it is an equity value ratio. Same with price to book ratio. The price per share divided by the book value you know, per share. So what it means is that if you are doing a trading, if you are using a trading comparables method, you cannot go and say EV divided by book value. It is completely wrong. And it will be against IFRS 30. And every independent consultant who will look at it may trash your work. So no, these differences must be known. Same with price to cash flows. We realize that all of these denominators are going to the shareholders of the firm. These ones accrue to both shareholders and debt providers. So these are the differences between the enterprise value ratios and the equity value ratios. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Hello. Yeah. Um, good morning and thank you very much. Good morning. Yes. Yeah. Please. So my question is, um, at what point will um, a research analyst go in for using either um, enterprise value or okay, equity that's, value? That's, that's great. That's a very great question. And we are going to address all of that in the next slide. OK. We address all of that in the next slide. So in this slide, I'm going to pick each of these multiples and then give you the finance explanation of these multiples and also indicate to you when um, it is right for you to use an enterprise value multiple or an equity value multiple. So the first multiple here is enterprise value to revenue. The reason I decided not to uh, dot points or bullet points is that usually when it happens like that, people will be just reading and wouldn't listen. So I want it to be quite interactive. And I believe that as I speak, the explanations you know, would um, come clear. So when we say enterprise value to revenue multiple, what, what do we mean? Basically, this multiple is all about trying to measure how much it would cost to purchase a company's value in terms of its revenue or in terms of its sales. It is used to determine or it tells you how much it would cost to purchase a company based on its revenue streams or based on its revenue amount. So what it further means is that a lower enterprise value to sales or revenue multiple could mean an attractive investment in the sense that it could mean that the company is relatively undervalued. And so investors who want to invest in that particular business with the hope or with anticipation that going forward, um, its value you know, would rise. 
So as I said, it is telling you how much it would cost to purchase a company in terms of its value, sorry, in terms of its um, revenue. Now, someone asked a question, when do you determine or what would happen for you to um, decide whether you should use an enterprise value multiple or an equity value multiple? Now, let's go back to this slide. Assuming that operating profit is not profit, but it is operating loss, you cannot use that multiple because it is in the negative. And you also wouldn't want to determine a negative value for the business. Even if a company is recording losses, it still has value. There was a time I remember somebody um, asked me, he was buying a business and the profits, like everything is in the negative. So the person was confused and saying that if the business has a negative or is making losses, how do you place a value on? But remember, the company also has assets. It has generators, it has computers, it has so many things, you know, that necessarily isn't profit. So for instance, if you are valuing a business and you are using the trading comparables approach, and this is a loss, earnings before tax is a loss, EBIT is also a loss, then you may have to come up and use the revenue multiple. I hope you get the idea. So this is one of the instances that would necessitate for you to move further up, especially when you are recording very low figures, when the company that you are valuing is recording um, very low figures. You cannot use a company that is trading on the stock market, for instance, that is making huge profits and use its um, profitability as a posy to determining the relative value of the company that you are valuing. It, it wouldn't make, you know, it wouldn't make sense. It's going to arrive, you are going to arrive at a negative value, you know, of the business. But, you know, in the valuation reports, all of these things are showcased. Talk about all of these things in the valuation report. Whatever happened during the valuation process is communicated in the valuation report. So you indicate the analyst or the transaction advice or the financial, whatever, corporate finance expert would have to indicate that. I chose so, so, and so multiple. But out of these multiples, some are returning losses and some are returning positive. And so therefore we decided to focus on the multiples that are producing you know, positive figures. So let me come back to this um, enterprise value to revenue multiple. One of the um, reasons why you may want to use the enterprise value multiple is, for instance, when there is significant differences between accounting policies of companies, you may want to use the EV to revenue multiple. The reason I'm saying that is that if there are so much differences in accounting policies, by the time you get down to net operating profit after tax, so many things has happened. And you may be using figures that probably are not similar to the organization that you are, the company that you are valuing. Because by the time they get here, probably depreciation, straight line metal, reducing balance metal, so many differences are taking place. So when you realize that there are so much significant accounting policy differences. It becomes very useful to use the enterprise value to revenue multiple. But in addition to that, there are so many you know, um, considerations. And I believe as we go along, those um, issues would come out accordingly. And the next one is EV to EBITDA multiple, enterprise value to EBITDA multiple. I don't know if I've answered your question to your satisfaction and um, the one who has the question yes are you yes. Clear? all right great yes. okay so enterprise value to ebitda and multiple the ebitda basically is your earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization the finance interpretation of this multiple is that it is trying to communicate to you how many times you have to pay EBITDA for you to be able to acquire the business. The number of times you should pay EBITDA 
for you to be able to acquire the business. That is the finance interpretation of the EB, EV to um, EBITDA multiple. Basically, it is using the operating profits you know, as a driver of the company's value. That is what EBITDA means. Again, if you look at this extracted financial statement, um, if EBITDA is positive, it is okay to use it. If it is negative, then it may not be a good you know, valuation metric to actually use. Same with enterprise value to EBIT multiple. The difference between the EBIT and EBITDA is that over here, you've taken out depreciation you know, and amortization. So most of the times, or let me say all the times, EBITDA is higher than EBIT. By the time you get here, you've taken out depreciation from it. And then you arrive at EBIT. That is also um, using operating profit you know, to drive the company's value. The number of times you would have to pay for operating profit for you to acquire a business. Mostly, investors will require that these produce you know, lower figures. And the company that is being valued would also wish that um, the figures are high so that the shareholders will also benefit, the existing shareholders will benefit from higher capital injection into the business. That is where the negotiation component comes in, where both parties come together and then negotiate on an appropriate mid-rate um, for the business. And then we also have the price to book multiple. So all of these are enterprise value multiples. These are equity value multiples. Remember, these are accruing to the equity holders only. The debt holders are not part of this. So price to book multiple, um, I would say it's, it compares the market value of a company to its book value. If you pay price per share and you divide by the book value per share, you arrive at the price to book multiple. If you don't want to go through the whole process of dividing the um, book value by the total number of shareholders and then price per share, all you can do is to divide the market capitalization by the book value and you arrive at the price to book value. So it is looking at the market value of the company, the shares, against its book value. And in most cases, people don't like higher PB you know, um, ratios or PB multiples. The reason being that you wouldn't want to invest maybe in, in a company whose market value is too higher than its book value. It could mean that the company is, is probably overvalued. So PB multiples of less than one is usually you know, preferred. But that is not a stand alone reason to judge that a company is either undervalued you know, or overvalued. And then we also have another um, equity value multiple that's a price to earnings um, ratio. Basically, the price to earnings ratio is okay. So, before I go on, can, can anyone help out with PE ratio? What does it mean? Any of the finance people here, Young Investors Network, your boss is here. Don't disappoint him. PE, PE ratio, what does the it PE mean? Ratio. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, um, the P ratio. Okay, my name is Lawrence. Great. And uh, the P ratio actually tries to tell us that how much you are going to earn on the, the price at which you are going to buy the shares. So if mm -hmm. you are buying it at once, how much will it retain? Great, great, great. That's great. And can anyone add to what Lauren said? There are so many interpretations. Anyone else? Is, is, is that price to earning ratio or price to book ratio? Price to earnings. Uh -huh, okay, okay, then that's it. Yeah. Any other contribution? Hello, Matilda, you can come in. Matilda, I see your hand up. Yeah, since the PE ratio, what I know is that is a uh, how much the company uh, is making mm -hmm. from their earnings in respect to their uh, share price. So in, in some 
in, in a case where that some companies have higher earnings, mm -hmm. but their price, their share price is very low. Mm -hmm. So you can also, it, it will help you to know whether the company is, is being undervalued or overvalued. Wow, wow, that's great. That's great. Any more? Okay, let me also add that. Is this Isaac speaking? Yeah, Isaac. So, Isaac. Yes. Okay, so it, it also indicates the duration of time that the investor will take to recoup the amount that he has invested in the business. Solid, solid, solid. So these are um, great um, explanations to what a PE ratio is. I'm very impressed. Everything you have said clearly indicates that the PE ratio is, is for instance, the CD amounts that an investor can expect to invest in the company, you know, to receive a CD of the company's earnings. That's basically what it means. And in our part of the market, most people don't like companies that have you know, very high PE ratios because based on what Isaac's explanation is, it means that um, if, for instance, a PE is, say nine, then it means that it may take nine years for an investor to be able to recoup, you know, um, what they had invested in the business. So there are so many interpretations regarding the PE ratio and it's very essential for every financial analyst, aspiring financial analyst to be able to know, you know, the interpretations and the ideas behind these multiples. It helps a lot when you are doing, um, the valuation of when you're undertaking the valuation of a business. The final one is a price to um, cash flow multiple. That is also an equity value, you know, multiple. Basically, it compares the company's market value to its operating cash flows, you know, over let's say the last four quarters. In essence, it's it shows, I would say that it shows how much cash the company generates you know, relative to its stock price. Again, indicating how much um, investors are willing to pay for every CD of operating cash flows. How much investors are willing to pay for every CD of operating cash flows. And every investor would want to see probably a lower, you know, price to cash flow ratio, um, somewhat indicating an undervalued stock. So these are some um, enterprise value multiples and equity um, value multiples. There are quite a number of them. There are certain um, RNS you move in and you may even need enterprise value to number of students ratio. You know, when you are valuing, for instance, a school. So it comes in depending on the industry that you find um, the business in, the business that you are valuing, where the business um, happens to be a triggers new multiples to actually come on board for you to analyze accordingly. Now, I want you to, to, to do this brief exercise for me. I would want you to calculate the enterprise value of ABC Company Limited based on the formula that I gave, market capitalization plus debt minus cash. And we've explained what this formula means. This is an income statement, and this is a balance sheet. Can someone quickly look through and help us in calculating the enterprise value of ABC Limited? Anyone should try for us. Anyone. Look out for the market capitalization, look out for the debts, and look out for the cash or reflecting on the income statement and the balance sheets. Anyone? Please, I wanted to try, but I don't have a pen and paper here right now. Okay. So anyone that I has- I can maybe call the figures. You can even use your phone. Yeah, like I wanted to call the figures and see that. That's okay, all right, that's fine. We have the market capitalization at the left hand side, which is 50 million. Great. 
So with the debt, you have short-term loans and long-term loans. Mm -hmm. So when you sum them, we get 800. Mm -hmm. Manage the cash. I can see cash mm -hmm. and bank balance. To so manage the 500 CD. 500 mm -hmm. credit. Mm -hmm. I think that, that that's all. <laughs> OK. That's, that's great. That's great. Um, sometimes eh, you may see on the financial statement. So basically, that's it. Sometimes you may see on the financial statement, short-term loans, long-term loans. You will also see creditors, you know, some liability line items. You have to watch out so that you don't go and choose other liability line items. The focus is on interest-bearing debt. So when you see overdrafts, it fits into this debt figure. Okay. But if you see something like trade payables, it is not an interest-bearing debt. So you don't include them in the calculation of the enterprise value. Okay. That's why I believe, um, who spoke, what's your name? The one who just spoke, the gentleman. Lawrence. Lawrence, yes, great. So Lawrence. that's why Lawrence didn't include trade payables. There are situations where the company may not even have any debts or may not have short-term loans or overdrafts or whatever. You don't have to force yourself to use, for instance, trip payables or some other you know, um, liability items. The focus is on interest-bearing debts. That is where the focus is on um, with respect to the enterprise value calculation. So let's move on. For here, we would end here. And then we will go and do the practical. So this brings us to the end of the basics of valuation. As I said, there are three main methodologies. What we are looking at now is the income valuation method. And under the, um, sorry, what we are looking at now is the um, market approach. And under the market approach, we are looking at the trading comparables method. So from here, we are going to demonstrate everything um, in Excel for you to know how um, a value, the value of a business can be arrived at using the trading comparables method. Before we go on, let me quickly um, run you through how it is done. So you have a feel, then we can move into Excel at the moment. So basically, we all know that for now, we know that when it comes to trading comparables method, you are determining the value of the company using you know, valuation metrics of other companies, other public companies that are traded you know, on a stock market. So how is it done? First and foremost, you have to go into what we call the search mode. Remember, for instance, you are doing a private placement transaction or you are doing an IPO and as part of the transaction you have to value the business. Once the signing of the agreement and all of that um, is done, the valuation now commences and you're going to use different valuation methodologies. With respect to the market approach, this is what you're going to do. You move into the arena of search. You know, what it means is that you have to search for companies that are similar to the company that you are about valuing. It may happen that the company may not even be on the Ghana, the company may not have similar companies um, that is trading, you know, that are trading on the Ghana stock exchange. So maybe you have to move to other stock markets, but the search is a very, very critical component of the valuation process. It means that you have to download financial statements of similar companies all right now when you download these statements you have to extrapolate everything into excel and then move to the analysis stage where you do your analysis historical growth analysis of the capital structure and all of that all what you are seeking to do is to fish out or to sieve out the companies that exhibit certain characteristics with a company that you are about to value Okay, so you do a lot of analysis and then you come into terms with the behavior of those you know, companies in terms of their financial statements. It, it's very deep because you have to consider so many things like accounting policies and all of that of those companies. So 
everything is done. From there, you move into calculation of the ratios of the companies that you're actually going to select. So you may have maybe 10 companies, but you may end up using two or three of those companies because you want companies that do not churn out enterprise value ratios or equity value ratios that are not too big or not too small. When they are too big, it could lead to an overvaluation of your company. If they are too low, too, it is going to lead to an undervaluation of the company. So a lot of you know, subjective analysis in addition to the quantitative analysis, analysis comes you know, to play. Um, right after that, you calculate the various multiples, you know, enterprise value to revenue, enterprise value to EBITDA to EBIT, and then all the equity values based on the companies that you have selected for the valuation purpose. And after that, you determine certain metrics, you know, uh, what we call the maximum, the minimum, the average, the mean, and all of that. You determine all of these metrics out of the main metrics, the main valuations that you have, you know, uh, the main ratios that you have calculated. So for instance, if this is ABC Company Limited, and we want to determine its value based on revenue, what we are going to do is to get similar companies to ABC, ABC Company Limited. We get all the enterprise value to revenue multiples to EBITDA and all of that. For instance, if the maximum figure for EV to revenue multiple is say four times or five times, we multiply five by 2000 and then we get an amount. And we say that that is the enterprise value of ABC limited based on the revenue line item. Then we run through the various line items like EBITDA, EBIT, earnings after tax, and all of that. So you get the respective or you get the, the ratios, the EV and the um, equity value ratios, and then you multiply them by the respective line items to determine a range of value for ABC Company Limited based on the trading comparables method. After that, then you move to other you know, valuation methodologies to determine other you know, um, values. And then that's going to give you a solid frame to actually um, work with. So having said that, we will demonstrate something brief in Excel for you to have a fair idea of all the narratives that um, I indicated. Any questions so far before we move to Excel? Any questions? Any questions? All right. Hello. Yeah. Is um, it? Using the discounted cash flow method, sometimes the financial statement of as a manufacturing company and a bank, there are mm -hmm. differences. Mm -hmm. So I find it hard using the discounted cash flow method for bank. I mm -hmm. don't know what is the best metric to use when valuing a bank. But with the manufacturing companies, I am comfortable with the DCF model. I want to know the best metric for a bank. Okay, you know, um, with, with respect to discounted cash flows, um, I will say that valuation thrives on, the accuracy of your valuation thrives on information, availability of information. One thing about valuing or using the discounted cash flow method is uh, knowing the exact values for forecasted you know, capital expenditure. Capital expenditures, and feature dominantly when you are doing a discounted cash flow method. And so therefore, if you do not have solid information to back that kind of forecast, then you may be arriving at a value that may be completely different from the truly intrinsic value of that particular bank. As I said, manufacturing companies, these are organizations that are much you know, capital intensive. And so therefore, based on historical occurrences, you can use those figures to 
forecast you know their capital expenditures but with banks sometimes it becomes quite you know problematic so of course you can you can use a discounted cash flow method to value a bank but at the end of the day you are not using just one valuation methodology so depending on the accuracy of the method that you use you now place weight on them so you know that, for instance, if you're valuing a bank, there are so many banks on the on the on the Ghana Stock Exchange, and so therefore um, you are heavily dependent on the trading comparables method. You know that as for this these figures you are getting, um, it is going to be really close to the true intrinsic value of the business. So at the end of the day, you are going to place a higher weight on the trading comparables method. You know when you are valuing a bank, you may also have the discounted cash flow method. All of those figures would feed into the valuation report. But at the end of the day, when you are giving your recommendations, you would have to recommend that you are placing a higher weight on the trading comparables method because there is readily available information. Over there, you are not, you didn't um, forecast for capital expenditures, which may be wrong anyway. And so therefore you are placing a higher weight on the trading comparables method. So it is very essential for you to explore various valuation methodologies. You know, you don't rely on just one. You don't say that because um, bank forecasting their capital expenditures is quite difficult, you are not going to do the DCF analysis. You still have to do it because it's very essential for you to get a valuation range, you know, um, based on these two valuation methodologies. At the end of the day, you are placing a higher weight on the one that's for your own objective thinking. You think that you have you know, the right information driving the value of that particular business. I don't know if the question is answered or if you may need further explanations. It is answered, but okay. I saw another fo formula somewhere. That was okay. easier, but I wanted to know Compared to the cash flow method, the discounted cash flow method, which one is a uh, better? It was like the EPS times one minus tax times the PE ratio. Okay, so um, the the focus of this session is the trading comparables method. I understand that there are people who are not, you know, who are coming from diverse backgrounds, who are not, you know, finance people. So Let's not jump the gun. It is a gradual process. Eventually, I know where you are coming from. Eventually, we will you know, definitely get there. But for now, the discussion is centering around you know, trading comparables method. Once it is grabbed very well, once you have the understanding, then other valuation methodologies you know, can come um, to play. So let's just not jump the gun. Let's move from one um, stage to the other. I don't want us to be mixing you know, different valuation methodologies here. Yeah. Any questions, contributions, additions? All right. So let's move on. Um, I need to clear this thing off my hypothetical say a real estate you know company and we are using the trading comparables method the trading comparables method you remember initially i said that you have to move into a search uh, mood and then search for similar companies you know that's trade or that are trading on an exchange so you have here company A, company B, company C, company D, company D. And then this is a subject company. Um, over here, we have income statements, extracts. And then we have revenue through to net income. One thing you should know is that this is an extract. And you have to organize a financial statement, all of the company's financial statements in such a way that would make it easy, um, that will help you know, facilitate the valuation process. The reason I'm saying this is that different companies, even operating within the same industry, 
present their income statement and balance sheets in you know, different ways. So in some of them, you are not going to see EBITDA. In some, you may not even see depreciation on the income statement. It would be in the notes to the financial statements. Okay, so after getting all that detailed data, you now have to prepare an extract with, for instance, these line items, revenue, profit before tax, depreciation, interest, EBITDA, EBIT, and then net income, that's net you know, profit. So you get all of those um, figures for these companies, for all of the companies that you are using as a proxy to determine the relative value of your business. Now, from there, you move to the next um, row where we have the share price for these respective companies, four cities, 3.5, 4.5, 5, and then 6.5. Then we also have the number of shares. Then based on the share price and the number of issue shares, you derive the market capitalization or the, yeah, the equity value of these businesses. So price times issue shares is giving us the market capitalization. So always, as I said, present the financial statement of all the companies in a unified format. That would help you, you know, a lot with the exercise. Now the next is a balance sheet extract. Again, Please, are you using a different screen now? No. Okay. Thank Can everybody you. see my screen? It's on the thing. No, no we are still seeing the old screen. Thank you for. Oh. Wow. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Um, I thought I was sharing it. Line. Okay, sure. Yeah, so um, Wilfred, Wilfred um, I wanted to find out for valuations, right? Um, although I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm joining, I have a particular area I'd like to find out some, some of one or two uh, areas. Yeah, so I want to find out what role does, um, what role do stock buybacks play in valuation? Usually they tend to give momentum to a stock price, right? So mm -hmm. to, in the whole valuation process, Stock buybacks are not really factored when you're beginning, um, when, you're, when you're valuing a company, but eventually if the books are looking good and maybe for some reason they have uh, steady cash flow like uh, Berkshire Hathaway, they do a lot of buybacks and they sort of boost the stock price. Does that factor in valuation? Okay, so um, that's, that's, that's a great um, question. And you know, stock buybacks are, they are, they are they are well established, you know, corporate, you know, strategies, and they have some similarities to um, dividends, and they provide investors with, you know, some kind of returns, you know, on their um, investments. Basically, if you look at the kind of markets we have, you know, our market is not really advanced like um, um, what, say, the United States has, and so therefore, in those markets. Stock buybacks, you know, play significant you know, roles with respect to determination of the value of the business because eventually they have a way of, you know, um, driving investors into, you know, that particular company, and so therefore it helps to push the price. So, um, in our parts of the market, um, in our part of the world, I, 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 I might say, the the stock buybacks are mostly not you know factored in because you you would even bear with me that even when it comes to dividend um, payments uh, some companies will be paying dividends but so the prices may not really you know be reflecting the payment you know of of dividends it's just because a market is not really efficient unlike you know um other markets in other markets even simple um not simple but certain news you know even trigger 
an increase or a decrease in the price you know, of, of an equity. So it depends on the kind of market that you know, we find ourselves in. In certain markets, just the news about, um, say, the policy rate, you know, um, an increase in the policy rate can cost a lot of issues on, on the stock market because it's a very efficient market and it reacts to you know information flow unlike a part of the markets where you know these things don't really um, impact stock prices in the immediate term so it, it all fits into the kind of markets that you know you are operating in as i said in certain markets if you do if you publish evaluation or let me say a stock recommendation report um, it even has a way of seriously impacting you know, the share prices of those equities on those markets. You will see that all the indicators are pointing to you know, a, a very weak performance, but then still people will be purchasing those stocks. In other markets, um, certain stock recommendations trigger serious you know, changes in, in prices. So it all has to do with the bottom line is information flow and how the market reacts to, you know, information. Um, if you are in a market where there's so much efficiency happening on the market, stock buybacks, you know, are really much considered. In other markets where um, information doesn't really affect the valuations of equities on the market, um, they may not really play, you know, a role. So it depends on the market that um, the, the organization is operating in. Yeah. Maxwell, are you okay? Hello, Maxwell. Maxwell has the question. Please go, ahead. go for it, please go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, let's let's proceed with the process for um, performing the comparables valuation approach. So we have, I have to go over everything again because unfortunately I thought my screen was being shared. So let me go over everything. So I'm back, I'm back. Okay, so I was asking if you were okay with, with, with the explanation or you may need further clarification. Yeah, yes, I'm okay. Uh, but as a follow up, there's, um, with respect to the practice of share buybacks or stock buybacks, um, there's this company, I won't disclose the name, right? And Instead mm -hmm. of using stock buybacks in a traditional sense, they've incorporated it into a bonus payment structure where they, they find that when they pay by annual, uh, by annual, sorry, every two years, when they pay general bonuses based on performances, they reward uh, stocks to people who performed, but then they invest these stocks or these shares for a locked period of two years. And after two okay. years, when after investing, they would give the holders or the staff members or yes the workers the option to sell back to the bank for for it or credit to their what csd account so what happens okay. is that it follows a certain cycle where okay. maybe the stock value might experience a jump when mm -hmm. investing cycles have ended so is that mm -hmm. not really special or is it a genuine way to use the stock buyback practice i just want to know what what is your take on what you just said Okay, honestly, with what I see in the Western world, that's not how they use stock buybacks, but mm -hmm. it's almost like an internal sort of restricted share, share purchase scheme that mm -hmm. they are running. I feel that maybe in a certain way, it might not give the external investor a full idea of how the share price is performing because this is like almost an induced form of um, price movement or whatever, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. All right, so... so um... Yeah, hello. Yeah, please, what's your take on that? I, I'm really curious about it because I had an opinion and people seem to disagree with me. Okay, so um, basically everything, you know, the, the, the stock market is actually governed by rules and regulations. And um, SEC, for instance, is very particular with anything that is closer to insider trading. You know, mm. if the, the idea or if the corporate strategy is to artificially control the 
pricing of the stock on the market at a particular point in time, then um, on the face of it, I may say that that may not be quite ethical because in a way you are controlling, we know people do a lot of stuff, you know, you are controlling prices and you are not allowing the market forces to actually determine you know, the price. So very, very um, well, you didn't disclose the company because probably you think that um, it's quite obvious. You think that um, it's not a good practice. And to me, whatever is done to artificially control you know, the pricing of any equity on the stock market is basically against you know, SEC um, guidelines and regulations. And it could be closer if the, if, if, if the intention is to artificially control the price. And that's, I would say, um, is quite you know, problematic, even though it may, may, it may not be directly associated with insider trading, but there is some kind of information that is going on. There's some form of activity, I must say, that is going on that is not in the public domain. And so therefore, investors probably may have the wrong sense of the, the, the trend in the price. So I, I believe that, uh, whoever it is, you know, um, may want to take it up further so that uh, discussions are done. And if it means that eventually it's going to be problematic for whether it's the traders who are doing it or it's a company who is inducing it, uh, they may have to have a real look, you know, at it. I may not be able to say it is completely negative because I strongly believe that there are some of the information that you are not sharing, you know, at the moment. So. Um, is a good case point that I believe must be explored um, further. We may not be able to pass 100% judgment on it at the moment, but the thing is that whatever leads to other investors being on the disadvantaged side as a result of not um, disclosing full information to them could be you know, quite um, problematic. So that's what I would say about that, the full information may help all of us to come to a fair, you know, judgment about this whole um, corporate action. I must say. Okay. okay. So thank you very much. So uh, I think after this, I would ask for your number from Kofi, and we can follow up with the discussion. So sure, that's fine. Yeah. You are Maxwell, eh? Yes, Maxwell. Okay. All right. Great. So um, let's proceed. Um, with the income statement extract, initially I was saying that you would have to move into the research stream and then get, you know, um, information, financial statement of similar companies that um, you are going to use or you are going to leverage to actually value the business in question. And I also made a point that you have to reorganize the financial statement to be in line, you know, to be uniform. So for instance, company A may have its financial, its income statement not showing EBITDA. You would have to calculate it to bring out the EBITDA. Um, some companies may not have even depreciation showing on the income statement. You have to go and fish it out from the note to the financial statement. So at the, at the end of the day, you reorganize the financial statement. After doing your, sorry, your um, entry, your data entry for all these companies' financial statements, you have to summarize them in an extract, you know, format to get um, something like this. So it runs through from the top line item revenue to net income. And from there, you get a market data that's the share price multiplied by the number of issue shares, and you get the equity value. This is the um, line items for the company that we want to value. Uh, revenue true to net profit of 90.5 billion. And then we also come to the balance sheet extracts. Also remember that if you pick a typical balance sheet, what you see is more than what is here. It is just an extract. You know. um, in this case, you are also trying to get a uniform format for all the companies. Cash must be indicated, total equity liabilities, short-term debt, long-term debt, cash and cash equivalents, net debts. And then that would help 
you to get the enterprise value. So quickly, if I put the Kesa here, you would realize that this value is looking at is a function of the market capitalization, okay, plus a short-term debt, a long-term debt, less cash. And that is giving us the enterprise value for me. So it runs through the enterprise value figure, sorry. So it runs through for all of them. So always make sure that these um, line items are showcased in the um, reorganized financial statements or the balance sheets. Um, so these figures are also for the company that we would want to value. Now we come to the valuation sheets. This is where um, you calculate the various multiples. So on this multiple sheets, we have three main items the market data, the financial data, and then the market data, we have the market capitalization, the enterprise value coming under the market data. And these are just linked to um, these sheets. The reason I brought the market cap and I didn't go straight to the enterprise value is that when we get to the book value, we will be using the market cap. Remember that is an equity value multiple. So we would also need the market capitalization you know, here. So there's a the market data. And then the financial data where we have the revenue, the EBITDA, EBIT, and net operating profits after tax. You know, so for all of these companies, from company A to company E. So after getting this data, you come and work on the valuation multiples. Enterprise value to revenue, enterprise value to EBITDA, enterprise value to EBIT, P ratio, and then price to book um, ratio. You can go on and on and on. Um, so if you pick company A, enterprise value to revenue multiple is 3.0 times. You are just dividing the enterprise value of company A by its revenue. And you are arriving at 3.0 times. Same with enterprise value to EBITDA, 7.7 .7 times for company A. So the financial interpretation of this would mean that you would have to pay EBITDA 7.7 .7 times for you to acquire you know, company A. But it doesn't end there. There are so many other considerations. That's just one um, interpretation. Same with enterprise value to EBIT multiple, enterprise value divided by EBIT. And then the PE ratio. So when we go to the PE ratio, you will realize that we move from the enterprise value to the market cap. If you look at this EV to EBIT, it is enterprise value divided by EBIT. But when it comes to PE, we are looking at the market cap by the earnings of the firm. Same with the price to book multiple. We also don't use the enterprise value because that is an equity value multiple. We use a market capitalization. So we run through these calculations for all of the companies to arrive at these ratios or multiples. Now you would realize that I have shaded company B red. What, what, what do you think informed my decision to do this? Can anyone help? Company B, it is shaded red. I want someone to critically look at it and then come out with any reason why you think it's been shaded red. Company B, look at all the ratios. And then tell me why, tell us why you think that company B has been shaded red. Anyone? Maybe if you start mentioning names, could you, can you help us? Could you add it? Okay. Could you, we are waiting for you. Uh, Ebenezer, I would draw. 
Jiben. Okay, so to me, uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you can. hear me, sir? Yes, I can. Yes, yeah, so uh, to me, out of uh, five ratios, you could see that the rate has the highest mm -hmm. highest. I think your internet is not um, quite stable. I don't know if I'm the but only one that experiencing is, it. Is the e can, can we hear him? I mean, I think he has challenges. Let me mute him. I'll mute him and um, Edwin. Edwin, if you can come in. It's and the P. So from my point of view, that is where. Hello. Okay, Venice, I really didn't hear you. We didn't hear you. If you can go, go, just go, go over what you just said. Okay, so uh, to me, out of. Okay, so Ebenezer is still facing right. challenges. Ebenezer. Okay, Eric. The five ratios. You could see click that is the EBITDA, EBIT and the PG. The basis of highlighting it among the other companies. Over, did you get him? Um, not, not quite well. If anybody else, I think his network is, is having, giving him issues. Okay, so Eric, I can see your hand up. Yeah, so um, I think I, I, I got what the other guy was trying to say. Um, so you can see that company B has some outliers, especially mm -hmm. in terms of the even to EBITDA and mm -hmm. even EBIT and the PE ratio, you see. So maybe using this company might over, if you use that this company as a comparable company to the actual firm we want to value, we might overvalue the company. So I think that's probably why they are sharp, like that. Sharp, sharp, sharp. That's, that's, solid. that's the explanation I needed. So you see, this is where um objective and subjective analysis um or thinking comes to bear you know um you shouldn't be a rubber stamp when um, you are you are undertaking evaluation exercise when the figures come out you have to think through whether it makes sense to include them or not there are certain companies when you should include them in the basket of the companies, you are going to arrive at an overvaluation and you may not be able to determine, remember the definitive words, the economic value of the business. You don't want to arrive at a value that is too high or too low than the business because if you don't take care, you may cheat, you know, the, 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 the um, original owners of the business. So there are certain situations that you find that would warrant or necessitate you excluding some of the companies. For instance, if company A has um, EBITDA, EB to EBITDA, EB to EBIT as negative, we can't use them. You have to exclude them. But the thing is that in order to demonstrate that you've done a lot of work, you've covered so many companies, everything that you are doing must be reported in the valuation reports. So in the valuation reports, you, could indi you can indicate that these are the companies that you selected. You analyze maybe five companies, you came up with four or three companies. Out of the three companies, because of certain outliers, you decided to you know, exclude them out of the final value or the final figure of the business. And any independent consultant or financial advisor who looks at it, at it would, would know that you are making sense. So know that when you are calculating the ratios or the multiples, it is not a cast in stone. You have the flexibility to take some out or to add some or whatever, so that at the end of the day, you arrive at a free and fair, or let me say, a, a, a value that reflects you know, fairness for the business, both for the existing shareholders and any potential um, investor who would want to come on board. Now, after calculating all of these, then you have to determine certain matrices, a maximum, mean, and a minimum matrices out of these. These are what we are going to use for determination of our company. 
for the generation of the value of our company. So this is maximum of all these companies with the exception of company B. Then this is the mean, the average value of all these companies uh, with the exception of company B. So it's around true. Some people go ahead to use different, you know, or add on other uh, matrices like hematic mean. There are so many of them that, you know, can be used. But at the end of the day, you have to make sure that the figures that um, you are getting are quite, you know, close to each other. There shouldn't be so much of outliers. Other than that, it raises a lot of eyebrows with respect to even the companies you use and whether or not you did the financial analysis well. Now, if you come here, you will see we've indicated a 20% marketability discount. The reason for introducing this is that, you know, the assumption is that all of these companies are trading on the stock market. And so therefore, they are very marketable. They are known even beyond Ghana. But we are now coming. We are a private company. Nobody really knows us that much, even though we have customers. But comparing your marketability to that of a company that is listed on the stock market, um, on the face of it, companies that are trading are quite you know, um, marketable. Um, and they are quite visible. Because you are always publishing your financial statements, you're always in the news, you know, you are doing facts behind the CPS and all of that. So the assumption is that you are, you know, marketable, both theoretically and practically. Even though I know some people may raise issues of some listed companies not really doing, you know, a lot of trades or being relatively muted on the market for a while. But the assumption is that companies that are listed on stock markets are quite marketable compared to their compatriots um, who are not on the market. So we are applying 20% discount on all of these multiples in the case of the company that we are trying to value. So these are the multiples. We pick enterprise value to revenue multiple. And these multiples, the maximum average mean, they are here, all right? And then we discount these multiples by 20%. So it's like more or less like this times that's 80%. The 80% is one minus the 20%. So instead of determining the value using 4.5, it has been reduced to 3.6 because the assumption is that we are not as marketable. The company we are valuing is not as marketable as the companies that are listed on the market. So we get a discounted multiple of 3.6. Now, how do we determine the value of this company based on the EV to revenue multiple? All we do is we multiply this figure, the discounted multiple, by the revenue of the company. And that gives us the enterprise value of a business, all right? That is for the maximum uh, metric. And then we also do same for the average metric, 2.6 with a discounted uh, multiple of 2.1. And when we multiply this by revenue, we are getting 625,000, sorry, 625 million. And then same with the minimum multiple giving us 315, million. So based on the revenue multiple, these are the values, you know, um, that we have derived for the business. But it doesn't end there. This is enterprise value. The essence is for us to get down to equity value. So remember that we said enterprise value is the market capitalization um, plus debt minus cash. Now we have the enterprise value of our company that we are valuing. We have to reverse the formula for enterprise value so we can get to equity value. So how do we do it? We can say based on the revenue, revenue multiple, 
you have an enterprise value of, so you can do for all of the matrices, um, maximum, average, and minimum. So I want to take, let's say, the average of the enterprise values. So that's 625,000. Sorry, let me just link 625 million. We are now coming to reverse the enterprise value formula to get to the equity value. So what we will do is, instead of adding debt, okay, or let me say, instead of deducting cash, we add cash, all right? So we add cash of 400,000, And then we deduct the debt of the company, 150 and 350. So we are saying add cash less debt. So this is going to give us the equity value. Sorry, let me just yes. Okay, six hundred and twenty five million eight hundred and eighty five thousand. 402 Ghana cities. How did we determine the share price? So we move to the next item that's going to be issue shares, which is this. And when we divide it, we get a share price. 62 cities, 58. So this is based on the average metric. You can actually run through for the minimum and the maximum. And after that, you do it, you repeat the same process for all of these line items. Profit before tax, EBITDA, and EBIT. So you pick, for instance, EV to EBITDA multiple, and then you repeat the same process. So what it will mean is that if you come here, the multiple of EV to EBITDA is say 8.8 .8 times, that's the maximum. You multiply it by EBITDA, you do same for the mean, and then you do same for the minimum. That is also going to help you derive a number of you know, valuation figures. And then based on that, you would also determine the share price. So, so many valuation, so, sorry, so many figures would come out from, you know, this exercise. But it wouldn't end here. You may also have to move to the arena of um, discounted cash flows. You also get a sense of um, the value of the business based on certain forecasts that you are going to, you know, undertake. So at the end of the day, you are going to get so many figures coming out you know, from the valuation exercise. And then uh, if you are combining different valuation methodologies, then you may have to weight them. Weighting simply means the level of importance you attach to um, each of the approach that you are using. You know, depending on, for instance, where the organization finds itself, depending on, for instance, whether it's an IPO or whether you are valuing the business to sell it or whether you are liquidating it, you are liquidating um, to pay off certain debt. So all of these would inform the kind of weight that you are going to place on these various valuation you know, approaches that you are going to use. This is just an illustration 
of how you can determine the share price based on the EV to revenue um, multiple. As I said, at the end of the day, you have to run through these, all these line items, okay, like the same procedure, and then different um, valuation figures would be produced. Most of the times, people um, go for the average of the prices, like what I have done. Um, sometimes, too, if the average is very low and you think that the company has prospects, you may want to use the maximum figures you know, to do the determination of the value of the business. So this is how, this is quite basic. This is how um, the trading comparables method actually um, works. Um, as I said, there are other approaches that can also, you know, be exploited. So this gives us 62.5 based on the revenue multiple. I believe that if we should do for all of these, we are going to get, you know, different pricing. And then at the end of the day, the team comes together and give a final recommendation, the transaction advisors, I mean, give a final recommendation as to um, which price would fairly reflect the true intrinsic value of the business. So I'll pause here and then invite any questions. Um, if anybody has any question, you can let us know or any contributions. Hello. Any questions? Hello. Yes. Uh, Ebenezer Odum. Hello, Kofi. Uh, don't you have any questions to ask? Um, all right. So um, I would want to know, for instance, um, if there's a company trading on the exchange and it has a price lower than what we have calculated right now, um, for instance, we use the minimum, okay, and then we ascertain, let's say, 60, the 62.59, and it is... Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello, Eben. I think Eben is... Since I'm the value this Eben, can you, can you go over your question? We lost you. All right. I hope the line is clear now. Yeah, it's clear now. All right, so um, my question is that, um, let's say we use the minimum and then we arrived at the 62.59 as a share price. And mm -hmm. this is a company currently trading on the exchange at say 50, 50, yeah, 50. Okay, let's say we are using dollars, so $15. Mm -hmm. If we decide to work with the 62.59 as its um, intrinsic value, which shows that um, it is currently undervalued. Can we say that it is in a good position to buy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. All right. We can. So, so far as the current trading price is lower than the intrinsic value, then it is in a very good. You are in a very good position to, you know, to buy because the figures, in your case, you are even using the minimum. You know, so once the intrinsic value is higher than what is trading on the market, then it means that the stock on the market is relatively undervalued. Therefore, the expectation would be that going forward, it is going to appreciate gradually to its um, um, real intrinsic value. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Do you have any questions for us? Okay. I think um, Michael, Angel, please go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so with the with the data that we use for this um, example, was it based on uh, a historical? I think was it a past data or was a projected data that was used for the analysis? Sorry, can you come again? Okay, so with the data that we extracted for this uh, analysis, was it based on uh, past data of, of the company? The, you mean the company we are valuing? Yes. Um, if, uh, on the second sheet, uh, we extracted for the first part, we have so many data from. Okay, this one. Is it this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. all, all okay. of this. Mm -hmm. 
were they based on the past? Okay, so this, I get where you are coming from. This is based on current data. Again, you remember I said that valuation thrives on availability of information. Okay. And so therefore, um, if information is available and you trust the source of that information, then it really helps with you know, the valuation process. So some people, for instance, may go, those of you who have you know, access to portals like Bloomberg, like Thomson Reuters portals and all of those research portals, um, you can get forecasted information or forecasted financial statements for the similar companies that you are using as a proxy to determine the value of your company. So where information is available, you can use the forecasted um, the forecast data. Okay, but the other thing you also don't want to do is to move into the arena of forecast and then not getting it right. Okay, so you are right to use the current data of a company, of the companies, but then if you get data on forecasted financial statements or forecast financial statements, um, that is also very much welcome. But at the end of the day, the data you are using should be something that can be heavily um, relied on. You can, on your own, decide to forecast, um, say, capital expenditures and et cetera of the similar companies. But if you, not, if you do not do it right, then it could have implications on the final value, or let me say the final price. So yes, you can use forecast data, and then you can also use um, current data. You know, if you are not getting solid or very reliable forecast financial statements, of course, you can use the current financial statements of the respective companies. So if, um, if, if, for instance, you are asked to value a company as at 31st December 2021, and then you have financial statements for all these companies ending 2021, you can actually use them to determine the value you know, of the company based on the relative valuation methodology. Now, when you go into the discounted cash flow um, approach, that's where you would have to, um, that's where, for that one, you cannot run away from, you know, from the forecast because you are looking into the future and then you are bringing the future values into the present time. So yes, this is based on current data and not historical data. The historical data, by that time, you've already, fine, you also need historical data, but with that data, you do the analysis and come out with the growth rate and analyze the capital structure and everything before you even come here. Then you can choose out of the numerous companies that you got in the basket. You can sieve out you know, the ones that you are going to use their current data or their forecast data for the analysis. Thank you very much, Lawrence. You're welcome. Thank you, Lawrence. Please, uh, thank you so much. But I wanted, I want to know if there are some extra videos that you think can help us, uh, like learn everything from the basics. Oh yeah, yeah. There, are, there are so many, there are so many videos. You know, um, so many videos. I think from here, I would actually liaise with um, the organizers, and then they will get back to you. There are so many sites. You know, so many videos that you can actually learn valuation from um, corporate finance institute, um, certified valuation analyst institutes, so many of them, you know, so many. There are so many materials available online that you can actually learn it from. Um, this, I must say, is quite um, basic, but a start from somewhere. Um, when you move into the arena of going on different stock exchanges, there are so many dynamics that also comes to play. When you are valuing a startup business, a company that just started, there are so many dynamics. But if we should bombard you with all those things, like we may end up losing focus because a start from somewhere has to be gradual before you move into the more, you know, complicated um, transactions. So if you're able to value a business, if you're able to do a valuation model, 
then based on that, you'll be able to, for instance, build an MA model, a mergers and acquisition model, which is very, very complicated. You cannot just go and start an MA model if you don't know um, how to do normal or simple valuation. So it's quite basic, but try and get this basic and then add. We will send you a, a number of videos, I believe. Um, there are so many sites you know, that you can obtain Excel sheets from and videos from um, to help with your study. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think even on YouTube, even on YouTube, there are a number of videos, so many videos. Mm. If you Google, let's say, comparable company valuation, um, you could see a number of videos. And then you can also register for certain courses, you know, um, mm. valuations, analysts, and all those courses can also help out. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank, thank you, Wilfred. Uh, Isaac. Isaac Berrigan. Okay, sir, I wanted to find out the duration of time that you can recommend to a, a potential investor as to when these figures that we have gotten will reflect in the market, considering the fact that the market, whether it's efficient or semi-efficient, and also considering other factors that might influence your evaluation, just like maybe changes in the company's management or something like external forces like a pandemic or something so mm -hmm. the duration of time you can give to an investor that within this period uh, uh holding all things constant that this uh, figures reflect in the market so i want to see the recommend recommended period please okay that's 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 a very um, um smart question actually when you are putting together the stock recommendation reports okay there is nothing like holding all other things constant because if you do that you may you may end up hurting your investors so what you may have to do is that um we have something called sensitivity analysis where you test the equity value of the company in terms of how it is going to change with respect to certain changes in the economy. So on a typical stock recommendation report, you may see sensitivity analysis indicating that if so-so and so happens, for instance, if GDP grows by this, weighted average cost of capital of the firm is going to decline or is going to increase, and that would cause the stock price to reduce, the price that we've calculated to reduce or to decrease. If, for instance, um, the company is not able to achieve 100% of the forecast earnings and is able to do only 80%. This is what the stock price is going to behave. It's going to reduce from, let's say, the 62 pesos, 62 CDs to probably 50 CDs or $50 or whatever. So at the end of the day, you give the investor ample information on the stock recommendation reports, the equity research reports, so that at the end of the day, they cannot hold the report and come to you and say that you said that the price is going to be 60 pesos or 60 cities by end of year. But we've gotten to the end of the year and I've rather lost money from 60 cities and it's now trading at let's say 50 Ghana cities. So sensitivity analysis is very, very key. You don't have to communicate to the, you know, investors are quite funny. They take us for our work. So the way of extricating yourself from such problems is to demonstrate the kind of sensitivity analysis you've done in addition to the basic um, value that you've arrived at. So if you pick, for instance, a typical valuation report for a private company, you will see that the company has given its own forecast. The transaction advisor will also have to do its, his own forecast to say that this is the management case, this is a transaction advisor's case. So sometimes the transaction advisor's case may, may see some similarities or differences with respect to the forecast amount. So you do the valuation on both cases, both that for the, um, the management case and then for the uh, transaction advisor's case. So you have a holistic view for the investor to actually make a very, um, a very good choice or a wise choice. So it is not advisable to 
put your chest out and say that by end of year, equity price is of a particular stock you've calculated is going to be, you are sure that is going to be 50 Ghana CDs or you peg it at a particular price. Of course, the Excel data calculations may give, you know, may help you derive these figures, but you know the kind of market we are in. Sometimes you can do analysis for an equity that is doing very well in terms of its multiple P ratio, um, dividend yield and all of that. But on the market, it is not doing well because of efficiency and information, reaction to information issues. So just to reiterate the points I made, make sure that in addition to the value you've arrived at, you do sensitivity analysis to cover yourself and say that if this happens, if inflation goes up, this is going to be the impact on the value of the business. If the company makes, um, let's say 90% of forecasted earnings, this is how the stock price is going to behave, you know, so that you have a holistic view for the investor to, to appreciate. Um, I don't like moving into the arena of assuring investors that by end of year, an equity price will do a particular amount because of, you know, past experiences. But if all indicators clearly show that there's going to be an appreciation, of course, you can assure the investor that there's going to be an appreciation. Then you show the report, indicate um, your projections as well as the sensitivities, how the stock price is going to be, you know, um, uh, is going to react with respect to changes in certain, you know, parameters. So sensitivity analysis is very, very essential when it comes to um, company valuations. Okay, uh, thank you, Wilfred. Uh, we have Siram too here. Siram. Hi, thank you, Kofi. I'm um, Wilfred. Good morning. And um, please, I wanted Hi. to find out. You mentioned you talked about the um, marketability discount, and um, and I realized you used um twenty percent. I wanted to find out is the twenty percent was it subjective? What was the basis for using twenty percent, or great, is that like question. a standard or average? No. <laughs> great, great question. That's, that's a very great question. And um, these questions mostly come out when it comes to um, choosing the discount rate. Um, there is no standardized uh, marketability, you know, discounts that um, you can fall on. Okay, if, if you look at data like Damodaran, the Modaran gives so much data on countries. So you can see equity risk premium data. You can see so much, so many data, country risk premium, premium and all of that. So um, you can find some kind of standardized data, you know, from there. But when it comes to marketability discounts, it is more subjective, okay? An acceptable discount rate ranges between 10 to 20%. It may even be higher, assuming you go on different stock markets. Assuming you are, you are um, valuing a real estate firm in Ghana, and you know we don't have a typical real estate company on the Ghana Stock Exchange, and you decide to go on the Nigeria stock market that is doing big ticket you know, transactions, whose revenue figures are very huge compared to you know, the revenue figures. So let me say whose income line items are very huge compared to the company that you are valuing. Um, it would be quite disingenuous if you use the figures, if you apply the figures raw like that without adjusting them. Because at the end of the day, you would end up overvaluing the subject company. That's because it is huge. You don't discount them. You are not on the Nigeria stock market. You've moved to it different company, different country, and all of that requires that the marketability must be really looked at because that is a very huge um, stock exchange, even compared to Ghana. So it is quite, you know, subjective. You know, it also depends on the um, income line items, the figures compared to that which you are um, valuing. If, if you are using companies that are doing, let's say, $500 million and your company you are valuing is doing about um, $20 million and you don't discount them significantly, you would end up, you know, undervaluing, sorry, overvaluing the business. I have seen in cases where um, some of the, the, the 
accounting firms use 19.2%, 19.5%, and all of that. So it is quite subjective. I'm here to see, we are all open to learn. I'm here to see any standardized you know, marketability um, discount ratios that is being recommended for our parts of the world. But the other thing too is that everything has to feed into the valuation report. And the reason for selecting the marketability discount, um, why you chose a 20% and why you feel that it should be 20%, the independent advisor may also think that the marketability discount should be increased or even in some cases decreased. At the end of the day, um, there will be negotiations and all the parties will come to um, a fair ground, yeah. So it's quite subjective. The more you increase it, the, the more the stock price declines. And if you reduce it, you see that the stock price will be going up. Thank you. You're welcome. So if we should do this, let's say 30%, We're even arriving at negatives. Sorry, I did it 300. So 30 percent. Automatically, it declines to 54.76. If this should go to 5 percent, 74 Ghana cities. So let's just maintain it at 20 percent, and then we have 62 cities here. Any other questions? Sarah, is it, is it okay? Yes, please, I'm okay. Thank you very okay. much. All right. Um, Ofer, I think there are no more questions, so we can proceed. Okay, okay. All right, thank you very much. So this um, brings us to the end of today's um, session. I believe that we've all learned um, something. Um, I know most of you are quite familiar with this. Um, I know there are others too who are not into research and corporate finance and all of that. But as I said, every business has a value and you may be running a business at a point in time where um, you may require you know, some valuations of a sort, depending on some kind of corporate you know, um, transaction or action that's may okay. You may want to attract new capital injections into the business and all of that. And that would necessitate you valuing uh, the business. And this is quite basic. And uh, I believe that it's been helpful um, for some of you. And um, in the absence of any further questions, uh, Kofi, I would bring it to a close. So you can take over. Thank you very much, Wilfred. I think um, this is a very powerful session that we've had. Um, the video will be available on YouTube, on Young Investors Network YouTube channel. Um, today, okay. today is quite a busy day, so uh, maybe by end of day tomorrow, uh, we'll make it available on YouTube. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Wilfred. We are very, very grateful. Right. Are very, very You're grateful. welcome. Okay, so um, see you all another time. Bye-bye. Okay, all right.